It is a great honor for me to be able to introduce our first keynote speaker, Cardinal Miguel Ayuso, President of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, who's going to share with us his reflections on the topic of our first panel, the innovations of Fratelli Tutti. A native of Seville, Cardinal Ayuso has had a long and distinguished career of service to the church and the world a priest of the Order of the Combonian Missionaries of the Sacred Heart. He studied at the Pontifical Urban University and at Pizai, the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies, before serving as a priest, a parish priest in Egypt and Sudan. He then received his doctorate in dogmatic theology at the University of Granada and eventually returned to Rome where he became Dean of Studies and later President of Pizai in 2006. Cardinal Ayuso was appointed consultant for the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue in 2017, I'm sorry, 2007, and in 2012 was called by Benedict XVI to serve as secretary of the council. Pope Francis named him cardinal and president of the council in 2019. In this role, Cardinal Ayuso has traveled across the globe to meet with religious leaders across traditions, to build trust, to deepen dialogue, he accompanied Pope Francis to the UAE in 2019, a trip that has already come up today in our conversations and which we will treat in more detail tomorrow. That trip that saw the signing of the document on human fraternity, a milestone in Catholic Muslim relations and the promotion of intercultural and interreligious dialogue more broadly. Cardinal Ayuso serves as chair of the high committee that is now accompanying efforts to advance the document's ambitious goals he also serves on the Congregation for the Oriental Churches and the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. Finally, I want to emphasize, um, partly because Georgetown University is a convener, a partner around this conference, that in addition to his roles as a pastor and his leadership in support of the church's efforts to advance interreligious dialogue, Cardinal Ayuso has had a distinguished career as a teacher and as a scholar publishing widely on interreligious topics and Christian-Muslim relations in particular. He also has connections back to Georgetown. I'll note that during the depths of the pandemic uh, about a year ago, we were honored to have Cardinal Ayuso participate in a conference we hosted online in collaboration with the council on how Laudato Si connects with and strengthens interreligious dialogue and world affairs, a the theme we touched on earlier this afternoon. That conference was online and virtual. We're especially thankful you can be with us today, Your Eminence. We're honored you've taken time to share your thoughts, and we look forward to hearing your reflections on the innovations of Fratelli Tutti and its importance for our world. Thank you. Dear brothers and sisters, dear friends, I am uh, truly delighted to participate in today's conference entitled, as we all know, The Culture of Encounter, The Future of Intercultural and Interreligious Dialogue, promoted by La Civiltà Cattolica and Georgetown University to celebrate the first anniversary of the encyclical Fratelli Tutti. I would like to thank the organizers, all the speakers who will help us achieve a better understanding of Pope Francis' encyclical. You, you ask me to share my thoughts on the topic that uh, you have chosen for the first panel, the innovations of Fratelli Tutti. 
And uh, I must confess that when I started thinking about my contribution to this first panel, I found myself in a bit of a quandary. I wondered, and I asked myself, what do we mean by innovations? Therefore, my mind went back to the impact the encyclical had when it was first published. I also started thinking about how often we hail the encyclical's novelties without realizing that Pope Francis has simply reiterated and reminded us once again of a truth as old as the world which is at the root of our faith, that we are all brothers and sisters. Stop. The title itself reveals a clear intention to speak to everyone as brothers and sisters, but an existential fact that Pope Francis unequivocally takes for, for granted because we are all brothers and sisters and no one is excluded. So when I think about how amazed some people are when they read the encyclical, it makes me smile, but it also makes us understand the situation in which we are living today. We are in trouble. Something is wrong. In the situation of confusion, fear and emptiness, we are plunged in. We must go back to the roots of our own faith. We must go back to what is essential to achieve a true spiritual renewal that can usher us into a culture of encounter, as this conference is suggesting. This culture is able to overca overcome differences and divisions and have a profound impact on life in our world. Pope Francis has not only amazed us yet again, he has also energized us. Almost 60 years after the end of the Second Vatican Council, the Bishop of Rome is asking the Church to let herself be swept by a renewed way of love that is capable of compassion, tenderness, attention, forgiveness, generating fraternity. Fratelli Tutti is a renewed invitation to open our hearts to what the gospel requires of us. St. John 23rd expressed it in very simple terms. He said once, it is not that the gospel has changed. It is that we have begun to understand it better. So our wish to build a culture of encounter must be guided by a constant reference to the Second Vatican Council and its message because it is the compass that shows us the way. On December the 7th, 1965, at the end of the Council, St. Paul VI summarized its proceedings with these words, and I quote, 
the old story of the Samaritan has been the model of the spirituality of the council, a feeling of boundless sympathy has permeated the whole of it. End of the quotation. So, as you can see, this is 1965. Now, the Good Samaritan is also at the heart of Fratelli Tutti. The religion of the Council said, St. Paul VI was primarily charity, and the current pontiff is acting along the same line. Vatican II is at the origin of this choice that does not contradict the previous path of the Church, but expands it in ways that are proper to our time. With the Council, the Catholic Church has entered what Pope Francis has called an era of change, rather a change of era. Not just a generational shift, but a broader and deeper disruption that affects everyone. There is no doubt that interreligious dialogue so central to the encyclical has an essential function in building a culture of encounter, an inclusive society, and is a necessary condition for global peace. Pope Francis' social encyclical speaks to the heart of Catholics, other believers, and all people of goodwill, open to all, inviting them to live according to a personal attitude of openness, compassion, and concrete service for the benefit of all. And the Church goes out. That is, she reaches out to others to encounter and serve them. She lets herself be challenged by the reality that comes her way, searching for new and creative solutions. So, looking at what is essential, and starting from the encyclical, I would like to suggest, since we are in a Jesuit uh, premise, three points. <laughs> I like to suggest three aspects for your reflection on the culture of encounter and the future of interreligious dialogue. Love, service, and peace. Gratuitous love for all. Urgent service to heal the wounds of humanity and working together for peace. Let me shortly reflect on the first point. Gratuitous love for all. We were, we were created by God with a great wish to love and be loved. It is not good for man to be alone. This statement reveals the profound truth of human beings who were created to go out of themselves to encounter others. Human beings are called to relate to other creatures through love, help, and respect. Jesus Christ manifested his love for the brothers and sisters with whom he lived through concrete relationships, inviting us also to wave tangible daily relationships of love with all the other children of God the unique. Pope Francis urges us to build a new world that rests on the pillars of fraternity and social friendship. 
These pillars originate from a love that is open to all and extends beyond borders. This is why before speaking more extensively about fraternity and social friendship, Pope Francis lingers on human and divine love in chapter three of his encyclical. Love is the originating root of fraternity and social friendship insofar as it creates bonds and broadens our existence from the depths of every heart by drawing us out of ourselves and towards others. In this way, the Holy Father, in continuity with St. Saint Paul VI, points to the civilization of love as the soul of the new world of which he dreams, a world that is open to all. Humankind reaches its own human fulfillment when persons and peoples live true relations, bonds of fidelity, communion, and fraternity. And in this context, fraternity blossoms from love and leads to a progressive openness towards others, making people realize they belong to each other. Pope Francis says, in the dynamic of history and in the diversity of ethnic groups, societies, and cultures, we see the seeds of a vocation to form a community composed of brothers and sisters who accept and care for one another. The yearning to build a civilization of fraternal love is actually embedded in human history. It is evident that love's gratuit gratuitousness includes our brothers and sisters of other religious traditions, not only as objects of our love, but as companions with whom we take the first step away from the walls built out of fear and ignorance. Together, we can try to build bridges of friendship that are fundamental for the good of all humanity. Fraternity, insofar as it comes from above, from the one God, is universal and generates brothers and sisters rather than partners. Therefore, Fraternity tends to erase the natural and historical borders separating individuals and peoples. The key to moving from closure to openness is realizing that social friendship and universal fraternity necessarily call for an acknowledgement of the worth of every human person always and everywhere. Dear brothers and sisters, at the heart of Fratelli Tutti is in fact the acknowledgement of the inalienable dignity of every human being. Second point, service. Urgent service to heal the wounds of humanity. In a dehumanized world in which the culture of indifference and greed mark the relationship between human beings, we need a new and universal solidarity and a new dialogue to shape our future. It is one of the principles of the social doctrine of the church on which Pope Francis particularly insists, solidarity. Solidarity is a word that is not always well received. In certain situations, it has become 
a dirty word, a word that they are not beset. Solidarity means much more than engaging in sporadic acts of generosity. It means thinking and acting in terms of community. It means that the lives of all are prior to the appropriation of goods by a few. Solidarity, understood in its most profound meaning, is a way, as Pope Francis says in Fratelli Tutti, a way of making history. As we know, Pope Francis' vision of solidarity finds its inspiration in the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable shows us how a community can be rebuilt by men and women who identify with the vulnerability of others, who reject the creation of a society of exclusion and act instead as neighbors, lifting up and re rehabilitating the fallen for the sake of the common good. The parable of the Good Samaritan challenges everyone, believers and non-believers alike. Like the Good Samaritan, we too must show our closeness to the wounded people or peoples of the earth and use the gratuitous love that overcomes every obstacle to put ourselves at the service of others, regardless of who they are and without expecting any reward. Pope Francis asks us to look far and become increasingly able to dedicate our loving attention to every situation of suffering and need. Such situations make our brothers and sisters the neighbor. The neighbor our Lord speaks of in the gospel. In a nutshell, we might say that looking far, inspired by the words and actions of our Lord Jesus Christ, means becoming close to everyone and especially to the least of our brothers and sisters. Fraternity is the most effective stance against our throwaway culture, which crushes and rejects the poor, causing them to die of hunger and injustice. Together with those who belong to other religious traditions and all people of goodwill, we must stand in solidarity with humanity that has been struck and wounded. Therefore, the way forward is to find the courage to give space to new forms of service and solidarity. Although the wounds of humanity are not emerging just today because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but rather are the result of centuries of exploitation and injustice. Unfortunately, the current situation has only made poverty even worse. Therefore, this cannot be a time of indifference, selfishness, or division. Not possible. All of humanity is suffering, and we must stand united in facing the pandemic and the other major challenges that threaten all human beings, such as the environmental crisis, as we know. So we can be sure of this. The experience of the pandemic will have served a purpose only if we emerge 
from it better than before, and if mechanisms are put in place to build the notion of us, starting from the awareness that, as Pope Francis stated, we are all on the same boat and that no one is saved alone. This devastating pandemic and its consequences are an opportunity for the church to engage in even deeper listening, dialogue, and capacity for service. In an interreligious perspective, the commitment of Christians to respond to the needs of those who suffer without distinction of religion and alongside those who profess a different religious faith will be a step forward in the direction of building a more fraternal world. Number three, peace. Working together for peace. Interreligious dialogue will help build a culture of encounter if we really strive to find shared points of contact to promote work for the common good. In this respect, a particularly strong signal coming from Fratelli Tutti is certainly the reference to the meeting with Grand Imam Ahmad al tayyib in Abu Dhabi in 2019 and to the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together which will be discussed at length during this symposium tomorrow. With this reference, Pope Francis again emphasizes that religions should not be used to cause division and push ideologies, but should all be at the service of the one human family. He clearly rejects any fundamentalist attempt to exploit religion to pursue specific agendas. Faced with the urgency dictated by the world situation, the Holy Father and the Grand Imam have testified to us that fraternal collaboration is possible. They have put aside biases, hesitations, and difficulties in order to move forward and overcome obstacles. They did not give up their identity in any way, nor have they referred to a superficial Irenicism. They strongly and boldly reiterated the need for human fraternity as a necessary condition to achieve the peace that the whole world is yearning for. The dream of fraternity involves all humankind, but it is entrusted in a special way to the believers of the different religions who are invited to stand on the side of the poor and become the voice of the last and to keep watch as sentinels of fraternity in the night of conflict. Being artisans of peace is a task we must share with believers of other religious traditions so that a culture of encounter may be affirmed and interreligious dialogue may have a future. The proposal is therefore to commit to the artisanship of peace, fostered by the awareness that every act of violence committed against a human being is a wound in humanity's flesh. We know very well that war is not a phantasm, but a constant, a constant threat. In fact, as Pope Francis says, we are going through a piecemeal World War III because conflicts are not over but are 
unfortunately multiplying here and there. And war, as we know, is the denial of all rights, as Pope Francis reminds us in Fratelli Tutti. Religious leaders must show that religion is not a problem, but part of the solution to bring harmony and peace to society through interfaith collaboration. Harmony must be cultivated and peace must be welcomed as a gift from God built by people in all circumstances. In today's world, where God is tragically forgotten or his name is abused, people belonging to different religious traditions are called in solidarity to defend and promote peace and justice, human dignity and environmental protection. And we must offer our collaboration to the societies where we live and share with all our common values and deepest beliefs concerning the sacred and inviolable character of life and of the human person. It follows that interreligious dialogue is becoming increasingly necessary, certainly not a luxury or an accessory to help this world to find peace. This is the challenge launched by Pope Francis to consider universal fraternity based on the dignity of the human person as a fundamental and necessary factor to build a dialogue for peace. Real and lasting peace will only be possible on the, on the basis of a global ethic of solidarity and cooperation in the service of a future shaped by interdependence and shared responsibility in the whole human family. Peace, the Holy Father says, also depends on solidarity and cooperation. Therefore, it is not a private matter, but fully concerns the management of public affairs, that is, politics. St. Paul VI said that politics is the highest form of charity, but it becomes so only if it can read the signs of the times appropriately. If it relies on the contribution from different segments of society, including religions, without discarding and marginalizing anyone. As Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who we remember since he departed last year, stated in his book, Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times, we all must play our part in rebuilding a common moral foundation to restore the common good in times of division. And herein lies our responsibility, certainly as individuals, but also as a community of men and women of different religious traditions. Among other things, Fratelli Tutti has the merit of offering universal fraternity as an interpretative key for political action, which must strive to promote an attitude of closeness to all human beings. The common good is the reference point, but the common good is produced by acting, not only by thinking. In this regard, Cardinal Parolin, Secretary of State, speaking to Catholics with political responsibilities in Madrid last month of September of this year, said that the culture of encounter and social friendship 
must be considered in their true meaning and action, not as mere declaration, but as fundamental principles, guiding criteria and effective instrument so that political action can be directed towards the common good and use the method of dialogue and counter and reconciliation. So we must ceaselessly uh, work in collaboration with people of other religious tradition to build peace and spread the culture of encounter throughout the world. Indeed, believers are witnesses and bearers of values who can greatly contribute to building more just and healthy societies, righteousness, fidelity, love for the common good, concern for others, especially those in need, benevolence and mercy are weapons that are part of the spiritual arsenals of the different religions. Let me conclude my keynote message today, returning to what I said somewhat ironically at the beginning. Let us not be surprised by the fact that we are all brothers and sisters, <laughs> because this is a truth that is rooted in the dawn of human history, and we should all come to accept it, whether we like it or not. Indeed, let us make sure that we do not reply as kind. Am I my brother's keeper? A harsh reply that opens the way to indifference and division, and which unfortunately is often the most frequent one. Therefore, gratuitous love, prompt and supported service, and the artisanship of peace can be shared with believers of other religious traditions because they are rooted in our common belonging to the human family that makes us all brothers and sisters. We can say with the Holy Father, and I end by quoting him, in this climate of deterioration, it is encouraging to think that the same concerns and commitments are increasingly becoming the shared patrimony of many religions. Thank you again for listening. His Eminence, thanks, many thanks for your inspiring talks. Thank you. And uh, now I'd like to invite our audience to open the floor to put questions to the, His Eminence. Please, I see Jose Casanova. Today we've experienced in the last years that the most difficult dialogue today is not intercultural, interreligious, but intracultural, intra-religions, intranational, not international. We, we feel it within the Catholic Church. We know how many Catholics are close to the message of Fratelli Tutti because the messenger may not be welcome. So how can we work not only for intercultural, interreligious, but for intracultural, intra-religious dialogue? Thank you. Thank you for your question. That is very appropriate. Since when we, uh, in our dicastery, but also in the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies, normally when we teach or speak or share about interreligious dialogue, 
we have also introduced in, inter, intra-religious dialogue. Uh, I was one in a meeting with BIPs and uh, we were talking in Arabic language. Uh, and one of these VIPs, he <laughs> he tried to speak in English, and instead of talking about interreligious dialogue, he was all the time talking about anti-religious dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to let him know that it, it is not anti, but interreligious dialogue and also intra-religious dialogue. You see, ecumenism is essential. We need to, to give a witness. And Muslim societies today, as I have seen also in other oriental traditions, and there are many divisions. Uh, and so there is a felt need a constant felt need, not for some religions and others not, but for every religion, it is very important to, to activate this kind of internal relationship uh, that will collaborate and help and support this interreligious dialogue Then we are, or intercultural dialogue, we are promoting together. So intra, uh, interreligious dialogue is very important. In our DICA study, we have published one document. We work closely with the World Council of Churches. And every year, two years, we take a topic and we discuss, and then we present topics from this point of view, how necessary it is to give a witness of unity in order to transmit a message and uh, to encounter the others. And this is what we call the others to do at the same time. But I see ne often we are very negative. How many times I listen to in the, in the Western world criticizing Islam and Muslims for being divided and, and then if we think the opposite, what about us, you know, in the West? And uh, I think that our true problem today in our societies, East, West, North, and South, is this the importance of collaborating in building a new society uh, with the collaboration of all religious traditions together with all the people of goodwill to transform and to change our society. Dr. Sultan Faisal. Uh, I would like to add a point here. Uh, usually we speak about coexistence and human fraternity and when we started the dialogue between different religions. Um, I, I think there is another perspective now, uh, nowadays, our world facing a huge problem like uh, climate change. So I, th I think finding this problem and start dialogue within the uh, religious leaders, so this will, I think, will create a shared, uh, uh, shared floor to participate and to get engagement. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. He is my brother, eh? Sahibi. <laughs> we are working together in the Higher Committee for Human Fraternity. It is very important eh, to work uh, together and, and to find our common ground for transforming our societies. Uh, here we need the collaboration of, of all, included, as I have said, several times with people of good will. So sometimes it looks like if dialogue be something like sitting in a round table for negotiating together. 
And this is not dialogue. Dialogue is not do ut des. Uh, I give you or I, I have the reason and you are wrong. And I, I have nothing to discuss with my brothers belonging or sisters belonging to other religious tradition because I am fully identified with my, with my own faith. So it's not a question of discussing face to face, but rather to stand shoulder to shoulder, side by side, hand by hand, uh, on the same platform, uh, on the common ground, and looking ahead of our world uh, and realizing that there is not only the problem of fraternity, there is the problem of environment. Uh, and the world is struggling in COP26 in Glasgow. And uh, uh, what it will be, we don't know, but we imagine, we imagine, we presume that it will be difficult. So standing one next to the other, looking ahead and um, proposing values and walking, walking together. I remember that once Pope Francis told us when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of our, the creation of our dicastery, that, that dialogue means that every one of us uh, become a companion of every human person we find on our life, uh, on our way to the truth. So. This is this is dialogue. This is the common project, and we have we are facing many many challenges. So rather than get discouraged, we have to come together because together we will be able to to face and to surmount so many difficulties. Sometimes people uh, are are facing and working together for the common good, protecting human dignity of every human person, anywhere, anytime, anybody. Giancarlo Bosetti, director of Reset Dialogue. Dialogues on civilization. Uh, I thank you for your presentation, for your keynote speak very clearly oriented to the dialogue. But what I mean, the question, my question is that uh, dialogue um, and what you said about dialogue is very important because dialogue cannot be taken for granted because every religion, inside every religion, there is there are many enemies of, of the dialogue. There is, it is even common sense that especially for missionary religions, there is a tension between between the announcement, let's say, call it announcement, Islamization, uh, uh, evangelization, and uh, the dialogue. Uh, how do you think can be governed this tension? How mm, do you see in your, in your experience of uh, dialogue, which is in progress, uh, uh, especially after the events that have been quoted of the Abu Dhabi declaration and the, and the, and the, the experience of practice in dialogue, how can be gone this tension which is uh, the, which belongs to every religion, even even in the Catholic Church, of course. Thank you. We cannot consider nothing for granted. Uh, sometimes we we think that uh, that we have uh, everything and that we lack nothing, and all of a sudden on the media they start saying <laughs> that there will be a big blackout <laughs> and that we will remain cut off uh, and. Dialogue, sometimes we think or may think that is something that is there. Uh, or peace, we think that peace is there. In my country, there is peace. No, we have to, to take care. This is like a small baby. And we have to, to take care of it. That we have to, to 
encourage to promote initiatives that may help communities. Uh, we have to work in a way so as to create, according to me, discipleship. Uh, sometimes there are people who are very referent, and we refer to people, to personalities, but uh, the, true, the true masters uh, uh, are people who are surrounded by disciples. So we have to, the need of creating this spirit of community, bringing people rather than dividing them, building those bridges. Uh, and it is here when we have to, to, to see these different uh, notes of the sound of music. Uh, if we want a concert, we need the sound of music. We cannot have a concert if there is only one note. Uh, we need the sound of music, the different notes in order to create. So uh, we have to be very attentive sometimes, and uh, it has been mentioned during the, uh, the first session, that uh, the first panel, that uh, we have to, to, to collaborate in, in, in a way that we may build our future. And this comes through a dialogue of life. Uh, and every day we have to take care of, like a mother takes care of his, her child. And like in a family, parents, they educate their children. Like in the school, in the universities, teachers, professors, they educate. Uh, education is essential. And we cannot avoid that. This is nothing mm, granted. We have to, to grow. And, and here, I think that uh, it is very important. And in this sense, I think that the gesture done by the Grand Imam and Pope Francis has shaken a little bit eh, the world. Uh, because as Professor John Borelli said, eh, <laughs> I, I, I did not expect a document like the one on human fraternity and the Grand Imam with the Pope writing a text for. Um, it, is, it is very important. But what is important is that we, each one of us, feel this call to uh, a commitment and feeling in society, not as believer, but as human persons, the responsibility in front of society and in front of our communities of being called to, 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 to act to act and not leaving it for, for, for others to do it. And, and this is not an utopia. This is not, a, it's not utopic. It's something that can be done. And we know because this is what we do on daily basis. And this is what we claim that the world may really, little by little, uh, be renewed in this spirit. And I think that what Pope Francis is doing and how he is pushing uh, in order to, not to condemn, but to call uh, with tenderness uh, human beings that uh, we are living in a wounded world and we need of healing. Are we ready to heal? There are many people who pass through and this wounded person, only one, a Samaritan, stopped, took him, and took care of him. So, please, each one of us, we may find on our way of life and during our lifetime, people who are in need, please let us not look at the other side to avoid this reality, but let us stop and help 
as the Good Samaritan did, and as Pope Francis is inviting us to do. Maybe we have time for a last question. Um, Roberto Ranzi, University of uh, Brescia. I took note uh, uh, about uh, your quotation of Pope uh, Paul VI at uh, the end uh, of the Vatican Council, and uh, Pope uh, Paul VI came from Brescia, so this is, oh. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I, but, I, I understand. Yeah, <laughs> but apart from that, uh, I see that very important that uh, Paul VI, uh, if I'm not wrong, was very in favor of the uh, construction of the big mosque in, uh, in Rome when it was uh, decided in uh, 1974. And uh, don't you see that the two popes uh, are linked uh, uh, in the opinion that the enemy are not the other religions, but the absence uh, of faith and religion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, Paul the Sixth and St. Paul the Sixth really, well, he were the protagonist for closing the Second Vatican Council, and uh, and it was him who. Uh, spoke uh, about dialogue in terms of colloquium uh, and at the time it was the necessity of having this colloquium uh, this colloquium with the world uh, it's uh, to open the church to the to the to the world uh, and and this was really uh, an excellent achievement that uh, opened the church uh, also with all the other aspects of the aggiornamento of the church brought uh, this new spirit to the church and to the and to the world so and this is this is something that is very 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 important and in this context uh, how important is uh, to be from la leonesa d'italia <laughs> Brescia. Uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, Paul, Paul the Six gave a lot, but there is this continuity on the pontificate. Eh? Sometimes people they like to to make a break or to divide and to and that is always, you know, this continuity. This is not something new. Uh, this is all as humanity is old. But particularly since the Vatican Council, Paul VI, he promoted this colloquium, dialogue with the wall. And then later, uh, John Paul II, promoting this dialogue with the wall, uh, started with the work of uh, a dialogue for peace. Uh, and here we have the meeting of Assisi in October. 1986, uh, this meeting of prayer for peace, that then it has been carried out since then by the community of Sant'Egidio every every year. We have just celebrated the last one uh, at the beginning of October. So uh, working for peace uh, and in continuity with this dialogue with the with the world dialogue for peace, then Pope Benedict XVI, he made a kind of, uh, I would say, of evaluation of what had been done uh, in order to avoid any kind of syncretism or relativism. He called for uh, implementing this dialogue with the world, dialogue for peace, but to be done uh, uh, in truth and in charity. Uh, so, like saying, we have to be fully identified with our own tradition and then open, open in charity to, uh, to, to others, uh, but without losing our own identity. Otherwise, this will lead to nothing. And in this spirit of dialogue with the world for peace, in truth, in charity, Pope uh, Francis, is the, since the beginning of his pontificate, the day after he started, he met with representatives 
we accompany them to greet the uh, elected Pope. And he spoke to them of a dialogue of respect and friendship. And so since the very beginning, Pope Francis has in his heart this desire of working and serving humanity for the good of all, for the common good, for the good of the human family. Thank you. Thank you very much, His Eminence. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>